Cornea Fellows. Uh, we're going to go in a little bit different order uh, than what's listed here. So we're actually going to start off with uh, Dr. Weinlander with a new technique for uh, scleral suturing uh, devices. And then I'll give a brief update on the effects of COVID on corneal transplantation. And then um, we'll end the presentation or end grand rounds with Dr. Gudgel with a case presentation. Um, so I'll let Eric Take it away with the first case or the first uh, presentation. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Lin. <laughs> so I'm sure I've met everybody at this point. I'm Eric Cornea Fellow. Um, I'll save Brett the other uh, introduction. He's the other fellow. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about a, a technique that we've been working on uh, to help with uh, scleral fixation. Um, <clears throat> and specifically, we're talking about scleral uh, suture fixation. Um, so this is a really broad area within ophthalmology. Um, it's a, basically a suite of different techniques um, to suture things to the inside wall of the eye. It's going to be lenses, capsule support devices, or prostheses, other hardware. Many, many, many different techniques for this uh, and many different variations uh, on these techniques. Um, so we're going to kind of give a bird's eye view, a non-exhaustive list of some of the important core elements and sort of what led us to uh, want to adapt uh, to uh, uh, challenging clinical situations. Um, so one really important thing to consider is uh, sclerotomies or access uh, to the, the ciliary sulcus or the fixation point. Um, you can look at these sclerotomies radially, circumferentially. Uh, there's many different ways to make it, uh, different tools that you can use, but Essentially, the main uh, point is it needs to fixate the lens in an appropriate position. Uh, we need to have easy, uh, uh, friction-free, trauma-free access uh, with instruments and the suture uh, through the sclerotomy. And you really need to be careful to avoid any damage to the retina or uveal tissue, uh, which is close by. Avoid uh, ripping off the ciliary body, avoid causing a suprachoroidal hemorrhage, uh, avoid uh, hitting the ciliary body causing a vitreous hemorrhage. Um, and then at the end of the case, it do need to be watertight. And over years and years, uh, ideally, uh, your wounds should support long-term uh, stability and the coverage and burial of, of the knot for your fixation suture. Um, in addition, uh, the method with which you introduce and externalize the suture uh, can also play into uh, intraoperative complications and long-term stability. There's sort of two large categories that uh, tend to be dominant for scleral suture fixation. And this is the docking or railroading technique or the handshake or grasping technique. So in the docking or railroading, you have an ab external guide needle, which is shown in the picture on the right, and an ab internal uh, fixation needle, uh, and you dock the two intraocularly and then externalize. The handshaking or grasping, um, you have your sclerotomies externally, and you have a grasping or a snaring or some sort of instrument uh, like a Snyder grasper, Condon snare, um, uh, uh, or what have you. Um, to actually grasp the suture uh, internally and externalize that through the sclerotomy. Again, the requirements are, are very similar to the, those of the sclerotomy. It needs to be safe, predictable, and uh, atraumatic. Um, <clears throat> then one of the other uh, important element is making sure that once you have you made a hole in the eye, you've got a suture through the hole, um, making sure that uh, you can talk <laughs> not appropriately and then bury it. Um, and there's uh, many different ways to do this. Um, the probably safest and easiest is to internalize the knot through the uh, sclerotomy. Uh, you can do what's called a Hoffman or corneoscleral pocket, where you do a partial thickness uh, limbal, uh, uh, lamellar dissection, um, where you hide the suture knot underneath the partial thickness flap. Or you can make a larger flap, or you can do these knotless suture fixation techniques all told needs to be stable, needs to minimize risk of suture erosion. Um, and just uh, in my opinion, I, I think you do need to uh, tailor your means of bearing the knot to the patient and the health of your tissue and, and those sorts of things. Um, so so right at, at the beginning of my fellowship, we uh, faced several challenges from a series of patients who were aphagic, avitric, and uh, needed a penetrating keratoplasty. So kind of a perfect storm for intraoperative complications. Um, and uh, we faced a lot of the challenges, not just in the learning curve and inherent to these techniques, but things specific to this patient population that sort of made uh, uh, made me uh, rethink uh, how, how can we uh, make this approach safer for, for our patients and for this patient population in particular. 
So with any of these techniques, you can have uh, issues where the sclerotomy leaks postoperatively and you get post-op hypotony. You can have uveal injury intraoperatively. And this uh, risk goes up the more you manipulate at the sclerotomy. The bigger the sclerotomies are, the larger instruments you use, the more time you're hypotenuse or open sky. Um, what can we do to minimize intraocular injury? Um, you know, avoiding things like multiple sharps docking inside the eye. And then uh, sort of as a side note, what, what can we do to help reduce reliance on uh, micro-instrumentation? I mean, uh, they're fantastic instruments, but they are prone to mechanical failure and their own problems. Um, and again, uh, this issue of uh, long-term uh, uh, suture coverage. <clears throat> so sort of the, the challenge that, that we faced, um, what can we do to minimize these risk factors uh, for this patient population? Um, and uh, this is a, a potential a solution uh, that, that we came up with. It's called the suture needle snare. Um, super catchy name, um, uh, and this is made uh, with a 27 gauge needle and uh, 80 nylon suture that runs through the lumen of it. Um, and you dock this all onto an empty 3cc syringe, uh, essentially uh, using that as a handle. Um, and the idea is that uh, you're introducing a loop of 80 nylon suture into the eye that you can use uh, to then snare and externalize your fixation suture. Um, with this uh, device, we pair it uh, with a 25 gauge needle sclerotomy uh, that's connected by a partial thickness scleral groove. Um, the reason for using a 25 gauge is we found that that is the smallest size that can accommodate a Gore-Tex uh, knot. Um, and the needle, because we feel that that architecture uh, is uh, the most self-sealing and the least uh, uh, traumatic. Um, and the general approach in this technique, I mean, it's still based on the same principles of scleral suture fixation. First and foremost, vitreous management. And then you make your sclerotomies, and then you introduce your means of externalizing the fixation suture, introduce the thing you're fixating, and then finalize disposition and tie and bury the knots. Diagrammatically, um, it looks kind of like this. So we have the suture needle snare in the upper left. Uh, you can see we have the 27 gauge needle with the 80 nylon suture running out of it. So the needle and the suture running out of it. And you introduce it through the sclerotomy. You create a loop inside the, the eye. You externalize this loop of suture. Uh, we use a Sinsky hook. You can use any hooking instrument. You could even use a grasping instrument. And then once you have this loop external, you can feed the fixation suture through the loop, withdraw the needle, withdraw the fixation suture, and this internalizes your loop of fixation, or withdraw the snare suture, this internalizes your loop of fixation suture, and then you withdraw the whole thing out the sclerotomy, uh, ending up with a fixation suture that's running in the uh, appropriate place. Um, so uh, to help visualize this, uh, we have a video uh, from a case. Uh, this is a, a patient, an a older gentleman who had a, uh, initially had a, a PK for post LASIK ectasia, uh, which subsequently failed, um, and he was left aphakic, uh, and he had a, a SAS post anti retrectomy uh, with a failed PK. All right, so we start by marking uh, two uh, points 180 degrees apart. We've already done our pyridomies. And then we're marking 1.5 and 3 to 3.5 millimeters back from the surgical limbus. And we're doing this in a radial fashion. Um, with the lens that we're going to fixate, which is the Bosch and Lohm MX60, uh, we feel that doing a radial uh, fixation reduces or eliminates uh, concerns of lens tilt. As our partial thickness scleral groove, and then this is the 25 gauge needle to make the sclerotomies at 1.5 and 3 to 3.5 uh, at the ends of the scleral groove. Uh, next, we're preparing the lens, so the Bosch and Lohm MX60, um, amputate the haptics, and then we feed our CV8 Gore Tex or expanded polytetrafluoroethylene suture uh, through the eyelets at the base of the haptics. Um, since we're doing a repeat penetrating keratoplasty, we're going to take advantage of the opening and the old PK. And here I'm introducing the suture needle snare through the posterior most uh, sclerotomy. I'm making sure I'm inside the 25 gauge needle sclerotomy, and you can see it is a fairly frictionless atraumatic entry into the eye. 
So we have the tip of the 27 gauge needle on the 80 nylon suture in the AC. We're externalizing. So there's the suture in the AC, and we're externalizing the, uh, the, the snare suture through the main wound. Then we're going to pass our fixation suture through that loop of nylon suture. And once we have that through the loop of the snare suture, the nylon suture, we're going to withdraw the needle and uh, gently uh, provide some traction on the snare suture to internalize the two loops and then externalize the fixation suture through the sclerotomy. Now we have our fixation suture uh, where we want it in a relatively atraumatic fashion. Now we're able to repeat this maneuver uh, for the remaining three fixation points, making sure that uh, we're on the appropriate side of the uh, uh, fixation sutures internally and that we're externalizing the appropriate suture uh, through each sclerotomy. I'm repeating this for the uh, inferior fixation points. And for the final fixation point here, And at this point, we leave the fixation suture a little long, uh, but that's not a problem, um, as you can just externalize the uh, tail end through the sclerotomy. Then we're uh, inserting our lens through the large uh, PK wound and centering it. And uh, we temporarily tie it and perform our penetrating keratoplasty, uh, which we zip through in seconds. Um, in this video at least. And uh, at the end, uh, what, I, what we don't have is we finalize the knots under minimal tension and are able to internalize, uh, trim and internalize the knots through the sclerotomy and then cover with our pyridomy. Okay, so back to the slide. So again, diagrammatically, this is sort of the overview of the technique. <clears throat> And uh, thinking about uh, what we were setting out to do uh, with this way, uh, this means a scleral fixation. Uh, we're trying to, uh, again, minimize our risk factors uh, for leaking sclerotomies and tissue injury. Uh, we're trying to minimize our reliance on microinstrumentation, um, and avoid multiple sharps in the eye, um, and enable a uh, complete burial of the suture. Um, we feel that using the 25 gauge noodle sclerotomy uh, and then having this, uh, this particular snare lets us use a 25 gauge sclerotomy uh, because this is much smaller than that and it's fairly atraumatic. Um, we were able to do the, the whole case without actually any infusion because um, we started uh, making the sclerotomies in a closed system and using a 27 gauge needle through the 25 gauge sclerotomy allows for this. Um, we're able to use uh, minimal to no specialized micro instruments, um, potentially increasing uh, the applicability of this technique to uh, uh, settings in which these resources aren't available. Um, and for full thickness burial, using 25 gauge needle sclerotomy is helpful. Um, we do have one intraocular sharp, but we at least don't have two. So hopefully that increases the safety. Um, and I'm just going to spend a minute here talking about uh, other suture snare techniques. Um, there really is only one. When it, after we were working on this, we looked back into the literature and we did find that there is a report uh, uh, from uh, Sunpak Chi uh, from Singapore. Uh, she's a fantastic anterior segment surgeon. Um, and she described a similar snare technique uh, using a uh, Gore-Tex through a 26 gauge needle in a Hoffman pocket. Um, we feel that our approach, uh, her approach is excellent uh, and very innovative. We, we feel that our modifications uh, help to make this more amenable uh, to the particular patient population we were faced with, namely a setup for a superchoroidal being uh, avitric, aphakic, and needing to be open sky. Um, 
in, in her technique, uh, she does use a Hoffman pocket, which we feel is not always amenable or not always uh, the best option for patients needing scleral suture fixation, um, especially if you'll be open sky um, because it's a relatively uh, friction, uh, semi-traumatic entry into the eye. Um, and in patients who have say, an underlying connective tissue disorder or you have worry about uh, a partial thickness flap covering vortex for years and years, you may want full thickness burial. So you, you really shouldn't use a hop and pocket. Um, in addition, we feel that our, our approach of combining, uh, of doing a separate 25 gauge sclerotomy and then introducing the snare rather than uh, in, in this approach, using just a single needle to enter the eye um, enables a frictionless atraumatic entry, uh, whereas you have to introduce a needle uh, wrapped in Gore-Tex uh, in, in the former. And we feel that uh, as atraumatic as possible of an entry is beneficial, particularly in the patients we were faced with. And, and then finally, we think that using a separate snare material, so using nylon for the snare and Gore-Tex or perline uh, for the fixation suture is beneficial, certainly in the beginning of the learning curve where you have uh, multiple suture ends on the field and you're just trying to keep things straight. So having a separate material for the snare and separate for fixation can be beneficial. Uh, so uh, in, in summary, uh, we feel that uh, our uh, variation on the snare technique, which we're calling the suture needle snare, uh, is a good low cost effective means of scleral fixation that minimizes surgical risk factors uh, for scler uh, sclerotomy leak tissue injury and uh, uveal injury, and it uh, is particularly helpful uh, in these avitric, aphakic eyes, uh, and it, especially in, in patients uh, who will need to be open sky during the procedure, as we feel that this is a, a, a fairly atraumatic way uh, to sclerally fixate the lens. Um, downsides, it does require thorough vitrectomy. Passing open suture loops through the eye, if you snare vitreous, is a recipe for disaster, so you need to be confident there is no vitreous as with any uh, uh, scleral suture uh, technique. Um, and the uh, steps of creating the suture needle snare uh, is a potential learning curve. And uh, this idea of, of introducing multiple suture loops uh, can certainly be a stumbling block to start. But we do feel that this technique uh, can serve as a useful addition uh, to current uh, scleral suturing and scleral fixation techniques. Uh, so with that, I'd like to thank everybody who helped out on this, uh, especially Dr. Lin, um, uh, and I really want to highlight the lab of uh, Janet Iwasa and uh, Grace Xu. Um, so this is an on-campus lab that works in uh, 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 medical animation, and they actually provided all the vector drawings uh, for, for this project. Um, I could also thank uh, Ethan for very patiently and uh, multiple times going back through the video. Um, and I'd like to thank the various sources that also helped us support this. Um, so yeah, that concludes my presentation. I'll, I'll take any questions, any feedback, uh, and uh, uh, any thoughts. Yeah, so thank you very much for that presentation. That was great. I just wanted to credit um, Eric with actually coming up with this. Um, I was voicing a lot of the frustrations with kind of the known um, scleral suture techniques that we were dealing with. And, you know, there is the Yamani technique, but that is not amenable to open sky, in my opinion. And I've heard of just, I didn't even attempt it because I've heard that there have been just, it doesn't work well in an open sky um, kind of arena. So th this has really, I think, maybe revolutionized the way um, we do uh, scleral suturing. So we, we just wanted to kind of let it be known that th this is something out there that um, I think a lot of people should try. So this is uh, Dr. Olson. I, you know, Eric, I think that was fantastic. And it, it's uh, fun for me to look back and see how this has evolved back from when we started to uh, suture support of, uh, of secondary lenses and when that was very controversial and uh, tenoproline was the go-to suture until we realized that didn't last that long. And that uh, uh, we still had a lot of them would last a while, but uh, sitting about eight, seven, eight years out, you started to get breakage and disappearing. And it's just a plot. All those have been involved in how this uh, field has uh, continued to evolve and move forward. And watch these elegant techniques in comparison to some of the things that we had to deal with in the old days is a, has been really pretty fascinating. So thank you for presenting this uh, you know, new approach, uh, in particular for a suture like Gore-Tex, which uh, I think that uh, far and away has the best chance of a suture fix fixation technique that uh, is going to stand up to the test of time. Thank you.
Okay, any other comments, questions before we kind of switch gears to my presentation? Uh, but excellent talk. Um, and I look forward to hopefully publishing this soon. All Thank right, you. So I will go ahead and share my screen. Hopefully, hopefully you guys can see my presentation here. You can see it. So, um, I wanted to switch gears completely to something different, a little update on um, you know, what's going on in the world of cornea. And we know that COVID has affected just about every facet of life as we know it. And I wanted to discuss the effects of COVID on corneal transplantation and specifically the effects of um, changing donor screening guidelines um, over the course of the pandemic and how this has affected actually our donor tissue supply. And then at the end of this, I'll talk uh, very briefly on potential side effects of the COVID vaccine on patients with existing corneal transplants. Uh, so as we know, March 11th, 2020, the WHO declared COVID-19 a global pandemic. Uh, however, iBanks around the world, even before this date, began to implement new screening guidelines to really minimize and reduce the unknown risk of uh, donor to recipient transmission. And Actually, a month before this, in, on February 3rd, 2020, the EBAA, which is the iBank Association of America, uh, came out with its first set of guidelines related to the coronavirus. And this was actually, believe it or not, before COVID-19 was the official term for COVID-19. So at the time, um, it was based um, on travel to endemic areas um, and uh, close contact with uh, confirmed infection. And then over the next few months during the spring, uh, there were further um, updates to the donor screenings as the pandemic became, became more and more widespread. And as we knew uh, more and more about the, um, the virus. And so there were actually monthly updates through the spring. Uh, by May, uh, the donor screening guidelines had become more conservative. Um, it was really, travel became less of an issue because COVID was everywhere. Um, and it was more based on uh, PCR testing, signs and symptoms of COVID, uh, potential uh, other alternative etiologies of their symptoms, whether or not there was close contact. Um, and that determined uh, donor eligibility, um, as you can see in the kind of right-hand corner of this. And by this time, um, I bank medical directors such as myself were being consulted on a pretty much daily basis uh, by our local eye banks with questions about whether very specific donors were eligible for transplant. And I, along with I'm sure many others were uh, erring on the side of deferring uh, donors for transplant, um, being very conservative just because again, we just don't know the risk of uh, COVID transmission from donor to host and no eye bank and no medical director wants to be responsible for the first reported case of COVID transmission um, via uh, donor, infected donor tissue. Uh, so in October 20, uh, 2020, uh, this has been the most recent set of guidelines um, that we are currently working off of. It's uh, just a little bit kind of different from the previous slide in May. Um, and the I-Banks have become a lot better about ruling in or ruling out uh, donors for transplant without uh, medical director review, but there are still um, instances, um, kind of as you can see in the, the right hand corner, where um, medical directors will be involved with making the call um, as far as whether or not a donor is eligible for transplant. And there have been a significant number of donor tissues that are um, excluded because of medical record review. That percentage has come down over the past uh, several months. It was at a high of about 9% deferral rate back last spring. Um, towards the end of 2020, the rate has been around maybe an average of 6%. Um, we don't have data for the last few months of, you know, the beginning of 2021, um, but uh, there's still a significant number of deferrals. Um, so I wanted to go, I didn't really go into specifics about the PCR testing requirements. So for donor eligibility, a COVID PCR test is considered relevant if it is done within 28 days prior to death and up to 24 hours after death. Uh, the EBAA actually does not require postmortem PCR testing um, of its member I banks. There are some I banks around the country that are doing it. Um, we are not, 
Uh, however, if it is done post-mortem, the EBAA um, will accept test results done within 24 hours post-mortem. So when would a PCR test be done post-mortem? So it is being done in cases where uh, the donor is also being evaluated for solid organ transplantation. So the uh, organ procurement agencies will perform post-mortem PCR testing. Um, or if a donor is a medical examiner case, uh, the medical examiner will perform a post-mortem PCR test. Um, however, the validity, validity of cadaveric testing um, is unknown. So thankfully to date, there have been no reports of COVID transmission via donated eye tissue. Uh, however, this has not been the case with solid organ transplantation. Um, so in the fall of 2020, there was a patient in Michigan who died of COVID two months after receiving a double lung transplant with tissue that was actually um, infected with COVID. Um, it, uh, scarily enough, the initial test was negative, which is why the tissue was transplanted, but it ended up testing positive later on. And even more scary, um, the transplant surgeon um, actually became sick with COVID, um, but thankfully uh, was uh, thankfully recovered. So this is a very scary situation that we don't want to deal with with uh, eye donation uh, with corneal donation. Um, but we think that the risk is very very low. Um, so this is a the results of an article that just actually came up in this month's cornea journal, um, showing that there's an absence of the COVID RNA in corneal tissue. Uh, so this was a study done in Germany on five uh, donors who had expired from COVID. And they show that there was negative tests in the uh, PCR tests in the cornea stroma and endothelium, bulbar conjunctiva, conjunctival fluid swabs, anterior chamber fluid, corneal epithelium. Um, and the average time between death and sampling was 21 hours. So this is all very, very reassuring that there is minimal or negligible risk of, of uh, COVID uh, transmission through eye tissue. Um, another thing is povidone iodine is actually used for um, uh, tish, uh, during tissue recovery. Um, and, and povidone iodine red, has been shown to readily inactivate uh, coronavirus infectivity on a logarithmic scale with exposure times as short as 15 seconds. And the EBAA medical standards actually had been updated to uh, do a double soak of povidone iodine before the pandemic. Um, the reason for that, uh, for that change, because um, it was just a single soak before, was uh, to really minimize the risk of uh, fungal keratitis and enophthalmitis after uh, uh, corneal transplantation. And so now the EBA medical standards uh, have been updated so that there's two soaks of povidone iodine, 5%, for two to five minutes, soaking the entire ocular surface, letting it sit there, then it's rinsed off with sterile saline, and then another two to five minute soak is done. So that has been found to um, uh, reduce the chance of uh, kind of fungus and bacteria, but also uh, with the coronavirus. So going, going back to the effects of donor, uh, changing donor screening guidelines on um, cornea donor tissue uh, supply. Um, so these two graphs kind of show um, what has happened over uh, the last year of 2020. So as you can see, um, so the left-hand graph shows uh, 2020 corneas recovered with transplant intent. And you can see that in April uh, 2020, there was a very low number of corneas actually um, harvested with transplant intent. And a lot of this has to do with the lockdowns of uh, elective surgeries uh, during the spring. Um, and our donor screening guidelines actually reflected that as well. Um, and very similar curve in uh, the actual number of corneas that were used and transplanted with a, a big dip in April. Um, as things opened up, uh, the numbers have come back close to pre-pandemic levels, um, especially with the actual number of corneas transplanted. There, there is a dip in November, December. I think this is a normal thing that happens every year just with the holidays and fewer operating room days um, being open. Um, so it's it's been great that we've seen uh, the rebound in uh, transplants. However, I wanted to point out this uh, light blue line here. Um, so this is a line showing US graphs that are actually used internationally, that are shipped internationally. And you had a similar dip in, in April here, but that level has not really come back up to the pre-pandemic levels. Um, and a lot of that has to do with a lot of travel restrictions, which I'm actually gonna go over in the next slide. So. Uh, 2020 overall donor corneas, um, these are corneas that were harvested with transplant intent, 
was down 20% overall from the previous year. Um, actual cornea transplants performed was uh, down overall 23% from the previous year. EKs were down 30%, EKs were down 16%. Um, April had a probably record low number of domestic transplants, only 822 transplants were done in the entire US um, in April of 2020, which was 19% of normal. Um, many eye bank uh, functions were curtailed internationally and the actual tissue, then if you look at the numbers of tissue um, sent from the US uh, internationally, that's actually down, was down 43% in 2020 compared to 2019. Um, many other logistical issues were present in 2020. There were delays with getting the results of postmortem testing, just with the labs being inundated with a number of tests being performed overall. Um, the reduced flights also affected the transport of corneal tissue around the country. Um, the reduced flights also affected cargo, and there were actually that were shut down on certain days, um, such as the weekend. So that affected um, uh, the transport of tissue. And so there was a lot of reliance on ground transportation with FedEx and UPS, but they were also dealing with a surge of in deliveries, um, not, not just from uh, tissue transport, of course, but with sort of, I'm sure everyone online shopping. And then meanwhile, the postal service was dealing with all the above, but also dealing with all the election related mail that was occurring in late 2020. Um, so all of this has result, had resulted in delays in the release of corneal tissue and also the time from death to transplant. Um, so I wanted to, to stop there and see if anyone had any any questions on, on this thus far before I kind of switch gears to um, talking about the vaccine effects. So no questions. Okay, that's great. So the next uh, slide of uh, talking about the COVID vaccine and uh, potential risk of uh, transplant rejection. So there have been several anecdotal reports of transplant rejection shortly um, after receiving either the first or second dose of uh, the COVID vaccines. And um, on our CureNet uh, Corneal Surgeons Forum, email forum, there's actually been 15 reports um, around the country of transplant rejection. So there's gonna be papers about this coming out in the coming year, I'm sure. Uh, but given this potential risk, um, uh, they're actually considering uh, recommending increasing a topical steroid frequency um, in patients with corneal transplants starting one week before the uh, patients receive the vaccine and continuing for at least one week after the vaccine. I haven't seen any um, rejection um, after the vaccine, thankfully. Um, and I've seen several patients coming back, you know, just for their routine follow-ups. They've had a PK and their PK looks great and they have received both vaccines and no issues. Um, however, in light of this new knowledge, I am um, recommending that um, patients come, you know, come uh, who have not received the vaccine, uh, just telling them to increase it uh, prior to and after the uh, vaccine dose. Um, obviously, I'm obviously uh, strongly recommending that all patients receive the COVID vaccine. And this is not a new issue. There are other vaccines which have been associated with increased risks uh, or rates of rejection, such as with the flu vaccine and the shingles vaccine. Um, so I wanted to kind of pause there as well. I only had one other thing if we had time uh, with a just an example of kind of the little mini dilemmas that I deal with, um, with our eye bank with uh, ruling in or ruling out uh, corneas for transplant. So any questions by anybody before I briefly go over that? Okay. Um, so this is just an example of, of some, some of the email exchanges that I have with my eye bank. So, um, this was in back in November, and this is the friendly email I got from our eye bank. So uh, it says we have two donors from this last week that were both um, OME, so Office of Medical Examiner cases. Both donors passed on 1031. They did not have COVID tests done by the OME until 11-2, which is outside of the EBAA's 24-hour postmortem testing. Both of these tissues are allowed for cases tomorrow. OME has not received the results from the health department on these two donors. Both of these donors did not have any signs or symptoms of COVID. Do you have any concerns releasing these donors without the COVID-19 test results? The test would not be valid anyway due to EBAA standards. So the first donor was a 30-year-old man who was found down with a single gunshot wound. Second donor was a 29-year-old man involved in a hang gliding accident pronounced on scene. So I, I read this, I responded, and I said, okay to release both donors for transplant. 
So probably about an hour later, I received this email. Um, says, after re uh, releasing the 29-year-old male uh, tissue, I received an email from the OME with the results from the 30-year-old male. Uh, the 30-year-old male COVID test actually came back positive. However, this is well outside the 24-hour test time, but it's still a positive test. We did not release this donor given the positive test, but are wondering how to approach these situations given this is most likely not a valid result. So my response was, okay, in light of the positive test, I agreed with not releasing. I guess if this happens in the future, I would release the tissue only if there was a negative result of a previous pre-mortem or valid post-mortem test. And also nothing else going on with symptoms or close contact. So, um, you know, the, these are you know, not cut and dry cases. Um, and so we've got to make these calls um, uh, regarding, uh, you know, potential COVID uh, in, our, in the, our donors. But thankfully, I think the risk is extremely, extremely low. But, but again, we just want to make sure that we, we really don't want to have any, any potential risk of infection. Okay, so that's the end of my talk. I'll take any questions if there are any. Um, otherwise, we will continue to uh, Dr. Brett Gudgel with his case presentation. Okay, can you all hear me? All right, well, I am Brett Gudgel. I'm one of the other Cornea Fellows. And I just wanna give a kind of a brief uh, case presentation um, and also kind of do a little brief discussion too. And then my talk's uh, titled, Why Won't This Heal? And so for our presentation, we have a 48 year old uh, woman. She admitted originally for a GI bleed. So she's in the inpatient service. And her chief complaint was that right eye pain and decreased vision. She had this eye pain for off and on for about four months. It was actually seen by an eye care provider two days prior to admission and uh, received a, a, was diagnosed with a corneal abrasion, given a bandage contact lens without any antibiotics. And since then, she feels like the pain is worsening um, and vision has declined as well. Past medical history wise, anxiety, depression, some allergies, some back pain, no surgeries other than in 1990s had a Schlesian excision, unsure which eye it was. Family history is not contributory. Social history, no alcohol use, does endorse medical marijuana use and vaping. And you can see her medication list there. On exam, um, just at the bedside, so near without correction, she's hand motion at six feet in her right eye, and then 20 25 in the left eye. Pupils uh, and intraocular pressure were both normal. Um, motility and computational visual field were full. External exam was unremarkable. The anterior exam on the left eye, uninvolved eye, was normal. On the right eye, just some highlights. There's some lead erythema and edema. Um, noted some uh, chemosis, and what was described as kind of a ring infiltrate um, with about 50% inferior, uh, inferior epithelial defects. Um, anterior chamber hard to tell if there was cell, really hazy view, but it seemed deep and the posterior exam was um, unremarkable. So this is a, a photograph, it's um, you know hard to appreciate all the details, but you can appreciate some of that um, and kind of inferior nasal um, uh, infiltrate, that epithelial defect does not really project, but then also some chemosis and injection there. So kind of our brief differential diagnosis is certainly not exhaustive, but, you know, we think in this situation, managed contact lens, not using antibiotic, um, admitted corneal ulcers is bacterial, maybe amoeba, also virals always on the list, fungal, and then some other non-infectious um, staph marginal contact lens associated keratitis um, and things like that. So we proceeded with treating like kind of a typical ulcer, removed the bandage contact lens, cultured that and um, the ulcer area, started broad spectrum antibiotics and also cycloplegic for her light sensitivity and possible AC inflammation. So kind of briefly going over a clinical course. So we first saw it on the 19th, um, the 20th kind of as expected, not really much of a change, culture's not growing anything. 21st, the lid swelling is improving, the epithelial defects improving. So she's actually kind of going in a good direction and start to kind of it's considered decrease the antibiotic frequency, adding some more lubrication, culture still not growing anything. And she's discharged on the 21st. On 23rd, she's seen in our cornea clinic um, and there's a little bit of a decrease in the epithelial defect. Infiltrate has gotten much better. Um, you know, and this is the typical intake process, get a little more additional history. She said, well, maybe I had this possible rash kind of around my eye on the right um, a few years back, hard to say. It wasn't really treated with anything. 
Um, and then on exam, besides the improvement in that field defect, did note to have some decreased coronal sensation, much worse on the right compared to the left. So at that point, continued to decrease the antibiotics, increased ointment and lubrication. So on the 26th, a few days later, culture kind of finalized no growth at all. Um, and there's really minimal change on the actual epithelial defect. We've kind of stalled out. The borders are starting to get a little rolled, um, pretty punched out or very well demarcated. The infiltrate's improving, though. And so with this appearance, um, you know, it's kind of more of a neurotrophic appearance at this point with the infiltrate nearly gone. And so um, we started kind of going down that line of thought, um, tapering the antibiotics some more, increasing lubrication, and kind of really started to discuss the need to protect the surface, you know, discussed all her options. She um, felt like she, you know, liked patching her eye at times because it helped with light sensitivity. And she also tried the bandage contact lens off and on. It kept falling out multiple times, but she, you know, wanted to keep trying it. And with kind of this intermittent um, therapy, she um, had significant improvement. There's no thinning, thankfully, and she almost entirely healed, which was very encouraging. But then unfortunately she no-showed multiple weeks of appointments, tried to contact her, getting her um, plugged back in. Four weeks later, she shows up, so she has worsening pain. Her bandage contact lens had fallen out about a week prior, and now she has uh, about 50% central corneal thinning in that area where the epithelial defect was nearly healed previously. And at this point with the thinning, we discussed some more serious options for her, um, you know, recommended tarsorphy versus maybe an ambio disc, which for those who aren't familiar, it's kind of a dehydrated um, amniotic membrane wafer um, with a bandage contact lens. And and uh, discussed her options. She was very, very tarsorphy adverse. And so she wanted to go ahead and try the ambio disc. And so we placed that with the contour lens. And we also started her in doxycycline and vitamin C to try to prevent further keratolysis and thinning. And one week later, she kind of canceled another appointment, no showed another one. And uh, she came in, her bandage contact lens was out um, again, but thankfully the epithelial defect was almost entirely resolved in that eye and the thinning was totally stable. The corneal edema that she was having a hard time getting rid of had improved. So she's doing really well, but um, she said, you know, my left eye is pretty blurry now and she had no prior issues with that. And so we look at it and she has this new large central epithelial defect in, um, with corneal edema in the left eye. It looked very similar to her initial presentation on the right eye. And so at this point, I'm thinking, you know, something's kind of odd. She's just losing these bandaged contact lenses constantly. I've never had someone lose so many bandaged contact lenses um, out of all the patients I've seen. And now it's bilateral. And so I think when in doubt in these situations, it's always important to kind of, you know, keep digging, repeat history, get additional history. And so I asked her, is there anything you could be using on your eyes, anything you're doing? She's like, well, I've been using this hemp lotion um, on my eyes um, every night. So I was like, gosh, I don't know. I've never heard of hemp lotion oil causing issues. So I did a case review on that and couldn't find anything. And she's like, you know, I also kind of rub my eyes every now and then. And so still kind of with when in doubt, keep digging. I did a chart review and kind of really dove deep over the past several years. And thankfully there's care everywhere on Epic, which is very nice, find other facility um, visits. And so she had multiple dermatology and emergency department visits, um, primarily focused on skin concerns over the past, you know, six to seven years, pretty frequently, multiple times, you know, a month sometimes. And the patient was pretty consistently concerned that her skin might be infested with something, maybe a fungal infection. And she said, sometimes she feels like there's worm-like things kind of coming out of her eyelashes very, very concerned about this. Um, a lot of the provider notes note frequent uh, skin picking during their exams and lots of um, kind of sores around her eyes and eyebrows. And sometimes these unfortunately get super infected with bacterial infections, which she'd been treated multiple times for. And so, you know, with this new information, the next time I saw her, I really kind of empathetically brought this up for her and asked, you know, maybe do you think this is kind of contributing to your situation? And she very emotionally admitted that she has this very severe kind of compulsory urge to kind of pick at her skin and rub her eyes. Uh, she admitted that her bandaged contact lenses would always fall out after she kind of would aggressively rub her eyes. And she really felt like she needed a lot of help with this and she was really struggling. And so I think that was really a, kind of a breakthrough moment for her care um, and having that discussion with her. So over the next month, with all this new information, the, the patient really started working on these compulsive behaviors. She's kind of trying to get them plugged in with some psychiatric help. And I think that's been beneficial for her. Her bandaged contact lenses, which would fall out, you know, almost immediately are now staying in. Um, and with that, her epithelial defects have uh, entirely resolved in both of her eyes. She continues to have this like very dry, irregular kind of neurotrophic appearing surface epithelium. And so we're planning on some scleral contact lenses for her in the future um, to see if we can get her surface a little more um, protection.
And so that's just kind of a, a unique case to kind of segue into neurotrophic keratitis or keratopathy in general, which I think this patient at least has a component of that. And so this is a degenerative disease of the corneal epithelium, you know, really kind of characterized by poor epithelial healing. And it's a multifactorial pathophysiology. I think a lot of people, you know, immediately think of, you know, a decreased sensation leading to a cold injury and, and also some decreased reflex tearing, but there's also a biochemical component where the neurotransmitters um, actually help promote, regulate epithelial health and proliferation and lack of those can lead to these chronic issues. So there's many, many causes. Um, you know, HSV, VZV are going to be the most common by and large, but there's also tumors that damage B1 distribution, topical medications, diabetes, um, and then the bottom bar list here, chronic corneal injury and inflammation, which I think probably contributed um, to this patient's situation, which is chronic um, recurrent corneal injury. So when you think of neurotrophic keratitis, there's really kind of three clinical stages. Um, stage one is going to be kind of punctate epithelial staining, decreased tear breakup time. Stage two, you're going to progress to more of an, uh, kind of a frank epithelial defect. Eventually over time, this with chronicity, this can um, kind of take that role orders appearance. You can have some pretty pronounced stromal edema and cell and flares so that can kind of make the picture a little um, murky, um, kind of confuse exactly what's causing this. And then stage three is when you start to have the stromal lysis and that can very rapidly progress to corneal per, uh, perforation, which is obviously obviously something we want to prevent. In terms of current uh, kind of traditional management for stage one, just lots of lubrication, try to address any underlying um, you know, things that are contributing to the issues like eyelid malposition. Stage two, start to kind of a, be a little more aggressive, contact lenses, considering a tarsor fees, serum tears, vitamin C tetracyclines, plugs. In this stage three, you really need to act pretty, or stage two, you probably need to act pretty urgently, but stage three, for sure you do. And that's when you start thinking more ambiodisc, prokaryotic, amniotic membrane. If there's a perforation or near perforation, you consider gluing, tarsorophy is always great, conjunctival flaps. And then worst case scenarios, you're thinking of penetrating keratoplasty to try to re, um, you know, reform the globe essentially. And they kind of segue, and that's kind of more traditional um, treatments, um, but thankfully there's some recent developments, both or semi-recent developments, both surgically and non-surgically. Um, surgically, we have corneal neuroticization, and non-surgically, there's some various uh, growth factors, proteins, peptides that are kind of coming down the pipe. So in terms of uh, surgically, corneal neurotization, I've always thought this was a really cool procedure, and this is actually the process of transferring a healthy donor nerve tissue to an area that um, is de-innervated. Um, you can do this direct or indirect, um, so you can use with the indirect method an autograft or even an acellular nerve allograft. There's multiple options for the cornea. You can do super oral nerve, super trochlear nerve, infraorbital nerve. This really can be ipsilateral or contralateral, so really depending on the patient's anatomy and situation, you have a lot of options. Um, this is a really interesting paper by Dr. Uh, Langold at Duke, um, who did a, a kind of a good step-by-step -step of their technique. And so you can see here, you have bilateral lid crease incision marks. Um, here, they're actually isolating the supraorbital nerve. And then they attach the, this, in this case, it's an allograft, an acellular allograft to the nerve. And then they pull that across the nasal bridge and then externalize it on the contralateral side. And they pull it through the lid to the conjunctiva, kind of split the allograft into different segments, um, make a conjunctival incision and bury this subconjunctivally around the limbus and then close that. And the thought is that this um, nerve tissue over the, I think there was about an average of eight months can kind of re um, innervate the corneal nerve. So Dr. Park and um, colleagues did a kind of a review. This is the largest review I could find in a, in a review article pretty recent about 2020 that had 54 eyes, various techniques, various underlying etiologies looking at this. And they found that both best corrective visual acuity and central corneal sensation improved. Um, for the patient, patients who had uh, residual limited best corrective visual acuity, it was often limited by corneal scarring. I think interestingly, children seem to do better than adults. I'm not sure if this has to do with kind of neuroplasticity or just their ability to kind of regenerate their nerves well. But that really, I think, pretty promising um, results for this. Kind of moving into the non-surgical options, we have Oxervate, which I'm sure most people have heard about before. This was FDA approved in 2018, commercially available in 2019. And this is a recombinant human nerve growth factor. So this kind of promotes the growth and maintenance of corneal nerves, also helps with cell proliferation migration. And it also is thought to kind of help with the limbal stem cells as well. So there's two kind of, uh, I think, um, really good studies that are in recent, um, recently published, one's in 2018. This was the phase two randomized controlled trial. They had 156 patients and they found um, about 55 to 58% demonstrated healing by four weeks. And this is based on different dosages. Um, and they defined healing by less than 0.5 millimeters of residual epithelial defect at the greatest diameter. 
And then by eight weeks, about 75% demonstrated healing. And in the 56 week follow-up period, there's only 4% relapse rate in the epithelial defect. And then more recently, there was a double-blinded multi-center randomized controlled trial that had 48 patients and they found that 69% healed um, versus 29% of just the vehicle group by eight weeks. And then at 65% had complete epithelial closure. So even more than that 0.5 residual epithelial defect um, versus 16.7% of the placebo. So I think there's some good evidence that shows this can really help um, people. There are a couple of downsides. I mean, what I have heard, I've never personally used it um, or have had patients under my care that have used it, but it's not exactly user friendly. Apparently you have to store this in a pharmacy freezer and kind of get your doses each week. It's a multi-step preparation process using multiple syringes. Um, and uh, cost-wise, this is, I'm not sure what the cost is. Honestly, this is just a screenshot from GoodRx. And so with a free coupon, um, we can get it for $24,000. And so pretty steep there, but I'm sure I've heard that the company has some good um, assistance programs. And so I'm sure there's some ways to help mitigate that cost. In terms of toler tolerance, uh, most common complaint is eye pain, but apparently through the studies, this was pretty uh, minimally impactful. And there's still a lack of longer term data, which I think would be nice to know just how these patients do longer than the 56 week period. Moving on briefly, kind of superficially covering some other things that are um, in development. There's um, products called regenerating agents, and these are engineered polymers, and these are designed to kind of uh, mimic um, stromal matrix. And so when you have this chronic epithelial defect, you start to have stromal matrix breakdown. It doesn't really create a good environment for the epithelium to grow. And these are thought to kind of replace that and help um, create a good area for the epithelium to, to kind of close that defect. There's a, a molecule called thymosin beta-4, and this is a protein that regulates uh, essentially cell proliferation helps epithelial cells migrate and also decreases inflammation. And then there's a, a molecule called Connexin 43, and this is a gap junction protein, and this kind of helps facilitate intracellular communications. And it's thought that, that these intracellular communications kind of play a role in the um, apoptotic cascade that can happen with these chronic epithelial defects. And so by inhibiting these um, gap junction proteins, we can kind of prevent that apoptotic cascade from happening. And then just briefly, some other peptides and growth factors, substance P, insulin growth like factor, insulin -like growth factor one in combination, these two have shown to promote epithelial cell migration and attachment. And then just regular insulin um, uh, applied topically has shown to increase epithelial cell proliferation and inhibit apoptosis. And all of these have, um, you know, in animal models and in very small clinical settings have shown to have some promising effect on epithelial regeneration and neurotrophic um, eyes, but none of them have undergone large uh, randomized controlled trials to really see how this goes. So kind of in conclusion here, some pearls I thought I learned for these cases and situation. I think neurotrophic keratopathy or keratitis is, is really something that almost every subspecialty in ophthalmology will deal with, and almost every subspecialty can even cause it, whether it's topical medications, retinal procedures, um, you know, trigeminal damage. Um, it's something we see a lot of. And with that, the initial picture can be super murky. It's really difficult to tell, is this bacterial, is this viral, what's happening here? Um, and even more worrisome, this can progress very quickly to perforation. And so in our case, we, you know, the patient was also followed for just a few weeks and had 50% thinning. And I, I'm sure that if we didn't see her even, you know, further out that she could have perforated easily. Like most things in uh, medicine, even as a cornea specialist, history is critical. And I think the thing I love about ophthalmology is things almost always have to make sense. It's a field that I think makes sense. And if things don't make sense, I think it's very important to continue to dig until they do. And then there's um, like so many fields within ophthalmology, some exciting advancements on the way. And I think this is a realm that we could certainly use some additional help because these can be very difficult patients to treat. And so that's, uh, that is all I have for us. Here's uh, my references. And thanks so much for your time. Well, thank you so much, Brett, for that really great review, really great presentation. Um, Dr. Degree had a question, which I answered online. Um, which I just wanted to highlight, you know, if a nerve growth factor improves nerve fibers, improving sensation and reducing pain. Um, so I just wanted to clarify that, it, you know, it does improve sensation, but it actually may increase pain when patients do that to that increased sensation. So I know you had mentioned that, uh, Brett, in your talk, but um, I, I think it's, it could be something significant that patients should be prepared for as, as they start something like Oxervic. Uh, but really great talk. And I think uh, you had highlighted the importance of getting a really good history when things don't make sense. I think that's true for a lot of things, um, not just this case, um, is, is really to dig deeper if, if nothing's really getting better in patients. Um, you know, not improving the way that you would want them to. Um, so I wanted to open up for any other questions from anyone else. 
Yeah, so uh, um, obviously this has been <clears throat> a major problem for those involved in the corneal field forever. And it's nice to see that uh, slowly but surely we are starting to understand more and more about the problem and coming up with uh, new means and ways of treating it. But uh, uh, it's clear to me we still have a long way to go. We, uh, a lot more we need to learn. Uh, it, it, it would seem relatively straightforward to figure out what, what it is that can be provided uh, to maintain a normal corneal epithelial layer in the face of uh, uh, you know, not having a good overall sensory nerve supply. Uh, I know there's some interesting work. Uh, I reviewed a paper not too long ago about uh, um, nerve transplantation that uh, I know you chat a little bit about. As, but one way or the other, I think we're gonna get there, but uh, I think the recent flurry of activity suggests it may be sooner rather than later, which is a good news. Thanks, Dr. Wilson. All right, well, that concludes our uh, corneogram rounds. Um, happy Wednesday, everybody, and um, we'll see you around. Thank you, thank you. Thank you.